Complete this phrase. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. I notice all the women were the ones that answered that. My guess is that you guys know it. You just don't want to remind anybody of that. You know that this line was penned in 1697, and it's been very well known ever since. Now, in the last half of the book of or Proverbs chapter 1, Solomon likens wisdom to a woman, and it is a woman who is ultimately scorned. And as we're going to see, the fury of wisdom scorned is no laughing matter. You have your Bibles there in Proverbs chapter 1. I want to begin with wisdom's straightforward rebuke in verses 20 through 23. Wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? If you had responded to my rebuke, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. This picturesque scene reveals a lot about wisdom. For one thing, wisdom does not wait for an audience to come to her, she's on a mission. And she goes out, both in home and in public. And I think that's a challenge for us as Christians and as a church. Too many times I think we take what I call a field of dreams mentality. You remember that movie? You remember the line that keeps coming up over and over in that movie? If you build it, they will come. You know, that's a mission of a lot of churches. If we build it, they will come. If we build an elaborate building, if we have magnificent services and ministries, if we offer, the people will just come to us. Guess what? They ain't. I mean, that's just the truth of it. They're not coming. Now, I think you could see a generation or two ago, it was fashionable even for people who weren't necessarily following Jesus to go to church. Back then it was the only thing to do. And it was where you would meet people in the community. But that's not happening anymore. In fact, what I hear is that the average church member attends church one Sunday out of four. What does that show about those who are not part of the church? They're staying away in droves. But that should not surprise us. What is the first word of the great commission that Jesus gave in Matthew 28? Go. Why? Because they're not coming. If our idea is that by being in church, The people will come and hear about Jesus and be saved. We are sadly mistaken. That's not what church is all about. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have church. I'm saying we should understand what church is for. Church is for the believers to come to be equipped so that we can go. Go into the communities, go into the workplaces, go into the schools, go into our homes and practice as well as proclaim what we're learning here. Wisdom goes. And notice where she goes. She goes into the streets, the public squares talks about the gates of the city, and that's where all the business was transacted. That's where things were done. She's not on some ivory tower. She's not in some isolated mountaintop dispensing nuggets of truth in a soft voice. That's not how wisdom is portrayed here at all. 
in order to be heard, she calls aloud, raises her voice, cries out. One author put it this way, Lady Wisdom is no gentle persuader. She shouts, pleads, scolds, reasons, threatens, warns, and even laughs. Pulpit bashing and hellfire preaching if there ever were. All quite unladylike, and nowadays also quite unfashionable, even frowned upon. Now, I'll be honest with you. My style of preaching is not pulpit pounding and hellfire and brimstone. That's just not me. When I was in Bible college, our professor believed in two things, preaching without notes and preaching loud. I didn't do real well. That's just not my style. But I think we've got to be careful that we don't become too passive and too cautious when it comes to declaring the truth. I think sometimes we're too hesitant to speak God's word because we're afraid that another person may not appreciate what we have to say. They might not like us anymore. They might unfriend us. And so we hold back. And it's not just the folks in the pew. Preachers fear that people might leave the church if they preach on certain subjects. And so they shy away from them and they stay with pleasant platitudes that wouldn't harm a flea. What we don't realize is we're not doing anybody any good when we're withholding wisdom. Now by picturing wisdom as speaking in the hustle and bustle of the city, Solomon is pointing out that the offer of wisdom is for the one on the street, for the business of living, not for the elite, not for the pursuit of scholarship. I'm thankful for those God has equipped, the, the learned ones who help us understand God's word better. That's great. But that's not what the Bible is for. This is not a textbook to be studied it is an owner's manual to be lived. And that's wisdom. Wisdom is taking the truth of God and bringing it to our daily lives. It's how to respond to the various situations we encounter. How to do it God's way. That's what wisdom is all about. When the book of Proverbs speaks of wisdom, it's not classroom or theoretical wisdom. It's wisdom for life. You know, sometimes we hear of people that have book smarts, and then you have people that have street smarts. Well, the ultimate book smarts that comes from God's word should lead to street smarts. There shouldn't be a distinction between the two. If this only tickles our intellect and satisfies our curiosity, we're missing the boat. Because God gave us His Word so that we would live the way He wants us to live. That's what wisdom is all about. Now, I mentioned wisdom's straightforward rebuke here because wisdom is pointing out something that's wrong. That word rebuke is often paired in Scripture with the word correct or correction. And I think they're two sides of the same coin. Rebuke is pointing out what's wrong. Correction is pointing out what's right. And when Paul is describing uh, the scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16, he says it's useful for instruction, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. God tells us what's wrong in his word. He also tells us what's right. In this point, wisdom is pointing out something that's wrong. And what's wrong here is the condition of wisdom's hearers. She mentions three types of people here. The simple, the scoffers, and the stupid. What do you mean by these? Warren Wiersbe writes, The simple are naive people who believe anything but examine nothing. They're gullible. They're easily led astray. These are people who say, if it's on the internet, it must be right. I heard it on the news. It must be right. They'll believe anything, but they don't check anything out. 
Proverbs 14, 15 says, A simple man believes anything, but a prudent man gives thoughts to his steps. So the simple are mentioned here. The next group are the scorners or the scoffers. They think they know everything and they laugh at things that are really important. Whereas the simple one might have a blank look on their face, scoffers usually have a sneer. They've always got a smart comment for everything. They've always got a way to cut things down, make fun of even things that are very serious. Proverbs 21, 24 says, The proud and arrogant man, mocker is his name. He behaves with overweening pride. And you see there the real root of that scoffing mentality is pride. I know it. I know what I know, and you people don't. I mean, I mean if you don't agree with me, puh, seriously. That's the scoffer. And then the stupid are people who are ignorant of truth because they're dull and stubborn. We're not talking about people that have a low IQ or maybe have never had the opportunity for education. Their problem is a lack of spiritual desire to seek and find God's wisdom. I know some people don't like that word stupid. Shouldn't call anybody stupid. That's not a nice word. The Bible actually uses it. In Proverbs 12.1, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. He uses the word. But whenever the Bible uses the word stupid, it's not on an intellectual basis. It's on a moral basis. It's people who should know better, but go off and do their own thing anyway. It's more of a matter of the will than it is the mind. So we're not talking about somebody who's intellectually deficient. We're talking about somebody who is morally rebellious. Fools enjoy their foolishness but don't know how foolish they are. And fools also tend to be very materialistic and humanistic. They don't they don't have any time for God. Everything's about here and now and how much I can get. Their bumper sticker says, he who, has, who dies with the most toys wins. Wins what? I have no clue, but that's their mentality. I'm going to get all the stuff that I can because that's going to make me happy. And when it doesn't, it's because I don't have enough stuff. And so they keep getting more stuff. And, and it's just a perpetual race, even though God says, you're not going to find happiness there. You're going to find it in me. But they don't listen. They have no interest in things eternal. So you've got these three categories of people. You have the simple. You have the scoffers. You have the stupid. And I'm sure as you're hearing me describe them, you're thinking of individuals who fit each of those categories, right? I'm sure we can all come up with our own list. But I think if we're really honest, we can see ourselves in each one of those categories too, at one time or another. Hopefully we're not there right now. But at some point, we were there. Truth is, wisdom only comes in learning from our mistakes. So if we've never been stupid, we'll never be wise. Fact is, we have been, sometimes we still are. But we can learn from that. Chuck Swindoll admits, it's not so much that we're ignorant, it's rather we're disobedient. More often than not, we know what we ought to do. We just plainly and simply don't do it. So our days are often spent having to endure the painful consequences of going our own way. So that's the difference between true wisdom and what Proverbs speaks of as stupidity. It's not our ancestry. It's not our education. It's not our abilities. It's our willingness to heed God's word. God has consistently hinged the welfare of his people on their listening to his voice, believing his promises, and obeying his commands. And here wisdom is pointing out to people who won't do that and saying, hey, there's something wrong here. And she's shouting it. I picture wisdom here as having a megaphone out on the street corner. There's nothing subtle about it. 
trying to get our attention. Unfortunately, though, not everyone reacts to God's word the way they should. And you see in verses 24 and 25, wisdom's shameful rejection. Wisdom is saying, but since you rejected me when I called, and no one gave heed when I stretched out my hand, since you ignored all my advice and would not accept my rebuke, It's not that wisdom is not speaking, it's that people aren't listening. They refuse to heed what wisdom has to say. And human history is replete with instances of mankind shamefully rejecting the wisdom of God. Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God puts Adam and Eve there and says, you can eat of any tree of the garden. I don't know how many trees there were, but my guess is there was more than two. (laughs) I'm thinking there was probably a whole bunch of them. Probably every fruit imaginable. They might have even had fruit back then. We don't have any more. Can you imagine how much Adam and Eve could have enjoyed going to all the trees of the garden, except one? It was in the middle. They could have worked their way around the garden and probably taken years. To enjoy them all. But oh no, they got to go to the one God says don't eat from. Then the serpent comes along and says, you won't surely die. Oh, your eyes will be open. You're going to be more alive than ever. And then he gives the real temptation. You will be like God. I think what he really meant by that was, you can be your own God. You can set your own rules. You can do whatever you want. You can be the captain of your own soul. And they bought it. And mankind has been suffering the consequences ever since. And we're all born with that nature that tends to reject God's instruction rather than receive it. I'm reminded of Jesus' words in Luke 13, 34, where he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. It's not that God doesn't care. We're not willing. We reject him. And what makes mankind's stubborn refusal so irrational is that God's commands, his warnings, are meant for our good, not even his. What he tells us in his word is for our benefit. And we say, nah, I got this. I want to go my own way. God says, don't do that. It'll lead you to destruction. Eh. Maybe it won't for me. Oh, it does for everybody else, but you know. Maybe it won't for me. Oftentimes, Tammy and I will be watching a show that maybe we've seen before. Maybe we've seen it a few times before. And we'll say, maybe this time it'll turn out different. Probably not. And we do the same thing in life. Ah, I don't have to do that. Oh, sure, it handled, you know, happened like this for lots of other people. Maybe it happened like that for me in the past, but this time's going to be different. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and over and hoping for a different result. But we don't listen. This was tragically illustrated in a story uh, told by Donald Gray Barnhouse. A small child squeezed past the metal railing at the Washington Zoo that kept the spectators from the lion's cage. And her grandfather realized that she was inside the cage. And, And she was 
facing him and laughing and thinking it was great fun. And the grandfather is saying, come, come out, come out of there. You got to get back on this side, come this way. And the more he said it, the more she backed away from him. And what she didn't realize is that the lion was coming behind her. And eventually the lion snatched her away, drug her back, and mauled her to death. Why? She didn't listen. She had an opportunity. Even after she made the mistake of going in, she had a chance to come out. But oh no, she thought she had it all under control. And all those people that were warning her and pleading with her to come out, oh, you people don't know what you're talking about. And that's how we are often with life. Peter tells us that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Just like that little girl at the Washington Zoo. See, God's given us his commands and his principles for our own good. It's not because he's arbitrary. He doesn't sit up there and say, oh, man, they're having fun. I better stop that. He does it for our own good. When he tells us, don't have any other gods before me, it's not just that he's jealous of his own position and prerogatives. He knows that if we put anything before him, it's going to hurt us. That's why he even at times disciplines us. It's because he loves us. Now, our rejection of God's wisdom may not be as blatant as that little girl at the zoo, but it still is belligerent. And whether it's because of mental laziness, not bothering to check out whether something is true or not, intellectual arrogance that says no one's going to tell me anything, or moral stubbornness, I'll do what I want whether it's wrong or not. We're indeed rejecting God's wisdom to our own shame. When we do that, we see wisdom's scathing response in verses 26 down through 32. Wisdom says, I in turn will laugh at your disaster. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Now again, we might be taken aback by this portrait. I mean, wisdom is laughing, scoffing at people's disaster. That doesn't sound right. How can that be? And yet we read in Psalm 2-4, the one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Yeah, there's a time when God says, all right, that's it, you're done. No more. And you know, some of us might have trouble trouble with that picture of God, but God is the one who put this in his word. The reason that he must turn away from those who will not come to his way is to preserve his own holiness. And he says, You can reject me, but only so far. And then that's it. There's nothing arbitrary, calloused, or hateful in this depiction. God is simply allowing mankind to exercise their power to choose. And we all have it. Ever since the garden, mankind has had the power to make choices. And every one of us is free to make choices in our lives but we are not free to choose the consequences of our choice. That's God's domain. That's where God's sovereignty is. We don't have to choose between divine sovereignty and free will. They are both true. 
We choose. God controls the consequences. And throughout Scripture, we are told that we are going to reap what we sow. Look at verse 24. Verse 24 says, Since you rejected me when I called and gave no heed when I stretched out my hand. Here wisdom is saying, I've called out to you, but you've refused to listen. Then look at verse 28. They will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look to me, but not find me. It comes back around. And I do believe that... <laughs> There comes a point where we don't have that opportunity anymore. A lot of times people ask the question, how can a loving God send anyone to a terrible place like hell? I saw a little video, in fact I posted it on my wall this last week, of a great answer to that question. The guy says, God doesn't send anybody to hell, we're headed there anyway. We're already going there. What God has done is given us an alternative. He said, it's like you're on a ship that's sinking. And everybody is sinking with the ship. But a crew member says, look, over there's a lifeboat. If you get on the lifeboat, you can be saved. So that lifeboat is Jesus. And we have the opportunity to get off the sinking ship. But if we choose not to, what's going to happen? We're just going to continue to go down the direction we're going. It's not that God sends anybody to hell. He's done everything he can do, short of taking away our free will, to keep us from going there. People send themselves to, heaven by, or to hell by rejecting the way to heaven. And as my dad used to famously say, you'll never see anybody being dragged into heaven by the scruff of his neck, kicking and screaming, saying, I don't want to go. God doesn't do that. If through our lives we tell God, I don't want you, in the end he'll say, okay, I'll give you what you want. And there are many people who think they can reject God's invitation time and time again. And when trouble comes, they fall on their knees and ask for mercy. Oh God, get me out of this. Now understand, they're not repenting of their sin. They're not looking to change their life. They don't want to follow Jesus. They just want God to get them out of the predicament. And that's when God says, I don't think so. You won't have me in your life except to bail you out of trouble? No, it doesn't work that way. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. That gives the implication that there's a time when he can't be. In the parable of the Great Supper, God closed the door on those who spurned his invitation. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Why? Because tomorrow may not come. Or when tomorrow comes, it still might be too late. According to Romans 1, when mankind continuously rejects God, God gives them over to their own depravity. There isn't anything unjust about that. That's actually the ultimate justice. People get what they deserve because they have chosen to reject God's grace. Yes, God is gracious, He's loving, He's kind, He will forgive any and all sin, He will welcome any who genuinely come to Him, but He is not going to be mocked and He's not going to be taken advantage of. His offer of salvation is, and wisdom for life is available, but that availability has limits. One of those limits is our lifespan. Once this life is over, there's no second chances. Hebrews 9.26 says, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that's the judgment. There's no second chances. And the thing is, none of us know how long we have to live. 
We may all admit that, yeah, we're going to die one day, but most of us think that's going to be a long ways off. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. And we don't know when. Another limitation is the patience of God. Genesis 6, 3 says, My spirit will not contend with man forever. It appears that there's a point of no return where we, we reject God and reject God and reject God and we get to the point where we couldn't come back even if we wanted to, but we won't want to. It's what the Bible calls the hardening of your heart. And when your heart gets so hard, you can't hear the voice of God. You say, when does that happen? I don't know. I can't tell you when that happens, but I can tell you that it does. And it may be one more rejection. Is it? We've passed that point of no return. Don't push it. Don't think I've got plenty of time. Don't think, oh, I'll always have a chance. You may not. It's actually very foolish to put it off. Now, this passage in Proverbs ends on a positive note. Look at verse 33. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. If we would listen to wisdom, if we would receive God's mercy and His grace and His instruction, what does He say? You will live in safety without fear of harm. We will experience God's peace. And in the New Testament, we're told in Philippians 4.9, whatever you have learned and received and heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. That's wisdom. Take God's word and live it. And the very next phrase says, and the God of peace will be with you. I think that only applies to the people who apply the first half. If we want the God of peace to be with us, we need to listen to his voice. We need to take his wisdom and put it into practice in our daily lives. But I plead with you, do not put this decision off. Hell hath no fury as wisdom scorned, but hell is the destiny for all who do. And so I invite you, if the Spirit of God is speaking to you today, respond. Don't put it off. You may not get another opportunity.